Greetings, this is Dr. Keith Boyd. The following presentation addresses public health ethics. The following are the learning objectives for the session. Name the most common ethical concerns related to the practice of public health. Describe the ethical concerns related to contact tracing and propose systems for contact tracing that are both ethical and effective. So let's start with a case. Henning Jacobson was a Massachusetts resident. Henning had experienced multiple complications of vaccination as a child. He experienced what he described as great and extreme suffering for a long period produced by vaccination. And he claimed that he was left with what he described as a lifelong horror of the practice of vaccination. As an adult, Henning refused a vaccination that was required by the state, and the state fined him. He challenged the state's requirement that he paid the fine. The case eventually re reached the Supreme Court of the United States. There, Jacobson argued that subjecting him to a fine for refusing vaccination was an invasion of his liberty and that no one should be subjected to forced vaccination, no matter what the reason. After deliberation, the Supreme Court found that the vaccination statute was reasonable protection of the public health while maintaining individual liberty, and that the law was a legitimate exercise of the state's police power to protect the public health and the safety of its citizens. Three years after the fight began, Jacobson paid the penalty, $5. $5, you say? Yep, $5. Why was the cost of the penalty so low? Because the case ruling was in 1905, over 100 years ago. By the way, $5 is about $150 in current dollars. The required vaccine was against smallpox. This case is a landmark case, considered one of the most important public health cases ever heard by the U.S. Supreme Court. The precedent set by Jacobson has endured as the re reconciliation of individual interests with those of the state to protect the health of the public. The ruling asserts the fundamental principle that all shall be governed by certain laws for the common good and reasonable regulations to protect the public's health and safety are justified based on, quote, a reasonable balance between the public good and the degree of personal invasion, end quote. The Supreme Court then reaffirmed its decision in another case in 1922, which held that a school system could refuse admission to a student who failed to receive the required vaccinations. So just what is public health? Public health involves a variety of professionals who focus on preventing disease and injury. It's a broad field and a variety of health professionals are involved. And the activities of public health include educational programs, development of policies and regulations, services directed at improving the health of the public and preventing injury, and research. Before we go on, we need to look at the intersection between ethics and public health, and I'm proposing a few assumptions. First, confidentiality and privacy are among the most important tenets of medical ethics. Second, autonomy, described as the individual's right to self-determination, is a fundamental principle of medical ethics. Third, protection of the health of the public is an important function of the government. And fourth, attempting to meet the requirements of all of these will inevitably produce conflict. There are also a few important differences between medical ethics and clinical practice and the application of ethics to public health. Medical ethics as applied in clinical practice is patient-centered. It focuses on the individual patient. Therefore, we prioritize autonomy or the right of the individual to make decisions regarding their health and well-being. On the other hand, public health focuses on a population. 
Therefore, when considering ethics, it's important to prioritize utility, which is the greater good. By maximizing benefit for all, this sometimes comes at the expense of a few. Public health officials have a mandate to protect the health of the public. Public health actions are often directed at a defined at-risk population, a group of people who are subject to specific risks for a particular disease or an injury. So to carry out the mandate, governments empower agencies and officials within public health with unique capabilities. The American Public Health Association has published the Public Health Code of Ethics, which is available to you on the internet. So let's review the principles of the ethical practice of public health. As we've established, government has a role in permitting and enabling public health institutions to fulfill their stated missions. Public health organizations and officials must balance their missions with respect for the rights of the individual and respect for diverse values, beliefs, and cultures that exist in the United States. Public health policies and programs must be developed with input from the community. Public health programs and officials also should work for the empowerment of those who are disenfranchised and the resources necessary for health of all must be accessible to all. In the practice of public health, confidentiality moves forward in its importance and public health practices must protect the confidentiality of the individual. There are limited exceptions that may be justified, but they're justified only based on the likelihood of significant Because infectious diseases are among the greatest threats to the health of the public, ethics in public health are often focused on how surveillance of the, and control of infectious diseases is carried out. Controlling infectious disease require the adoption of control measures by all citizens. And this may contradict the individual's right to make a choice may also involve an inconvenience or a more significant sacrifice on the part of the individual for the greater good. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the 10 most important public health achievements in the United States in the 20th century, that is between 1900 and 1999, are the following. And note that these are not in any particular order. Vaccination, motor vehicle safety, safer workplaces, control of infectious diseases, decline in deaths from coronary artery disease and stroke, safer and healthier foods, healthier mothers and babies, and family planning. Notice that two of these, vaccination and control of infectious diseases, are part of what we're discussing. In examining the practices of immunizations, the conflict inevitably arises between autonomy and utility. And this is an example of how the priorities might conflict with one another and how we can reconcile this conflict. So let's look at autonomy. Autonomy is the individual's right to choose. An immunization might cause harm to any individual. It could be pain from the injection, it could be side effects, or some significant adverse reaction, like an allergic reaction. So the potential harm to any one individual could be significant. Utility, on the other hand, examines the obligation of the state to protect the health of all. The prevention of many infectious diseases requires most of the population to be immune. So how does this conflict get resolved? A balance must be struck a balance between protecting the public's health and respecting the confidentiality of the individual. And in the control of disease, data collection in public health is routine. 
These diseases include infectious diseases, but many other diseases for which collecting data is a vital function in management and control of the disease. So already data is routinely collected and utilized for a variety of reasons in a variety of settings. A couple examples include epidemiological data regarding disease surveillance. How often do those diseases occur and what settings and what the outcomes are. And there are databases of various treatments for cancer, for example. These are critical in allowing patients to make informed choices, selecting the most effective treatment given their particular circumstances that include age, stage of disease, and other factors. And contract tracing is another example. It's a common public health tool that's used in the control of infectious diseases. Contact tracing is used every day by public health officials to protect the health of the public, and it's ongoing. It allows officials to track contacts between patients who may be infectious and others, and allows them to intervene to prevent the spread of communicable disease. Recently, the use of technology for contact tracing has been the subject of much discussion because digital technologies may be very useful tools in tracking contacts. And we've seen how they have been used in certain settings to effectively control infectious diseases. But their use must be transparent. That is to say that all involved must know that these devices, this technology is being used. This requires individuals to consent to share information typically deemed to be very private for example, where one travels or who one associates with. And releasing this data could have unintended consequences. So governments, public officials, and technology companies must engage stakeholders, those who are affected by the uses of these technologies. And they must do this to develop systems that are effective as public health tools, but also ensure the privacy of the individual. And infringements on liberty must be justified by the circumstances of the transmission of the disease. In order to practice public health in these circumstances, let's just examine a few important considerations. So only those data that are necessary and relevant for the public health purposes should be collected. And any identifiable data should be stored securely and only for the time that the public health purposes require. Afterwards, it should be destroyed. Oversight, accountability, and consequences for abuse or misuse of these data must be explicit and enforceable. Public health technology should be designed to rectify the digital divide. That is to say, those technologies and programs must address the existing inequalities to access to technologies. And the privacy infringement that may be less intrusive than blanket population level lockdowns for everyone must be the case. In other words, any loss of personal liberty must be necessary as a control measure because it's more effective than blanket population level lockdowns. And let me remind you just at this point of the important principle of justice and ethics that speaks to the equality in both benefit and impact so that any of these programs must be judged in light of justice. And there's just so much to discuss regarding the importance of public health in a pandemic. Issues around the pandemic are, in highlight, are highlighting the tensions between public health and personal autonomy interspersed with politics. So there's so many questions that are arising that have to be resolved. What is the role of government agencies such as the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control? Can the government mandate citizens to wear masks, for example, to control an infectious disease? Can organizations like schools and companies mandate the vaccine? So as a review, let's return to our learning objectives. Name the most common ethical concerns related to the practice of public health. Describe the ethical concerns related to contact tracing. 
and propose systems for contact tracing that are both ethical and effective. Hopefully, having reviewed this video, you've accomplished these learning objectives. Here's a list of references used in the development of this video. Thanks very much for watching.